Okay, everybody, um, welcome back for our final session. What we're going to do now um, is a slightly less structured kind of thing, but um, what I'd like to do is ask each, the spokesperson from each of the four groups to give us a very brief um, summary of the discussion that went in in their respective group. Um, and if they, ha if they can, perhaps try to sort of boil it down to up to about five key points um, just for the information of those people who are in a different group and would like to know, have, have a sense of what discussion went on in, that, in the groups they weren't at. Um, what we are going to do, uh, as you know, this is all being recorded, so what we're going to do after the end of this conference is, is write up these discussions and we'll be posting them on the, on the conference website so that you'll, have, you'll be able to access a fuller record of, of these discussions um, in, in due course. Can't, can't promise to have it done by Monday, but we'll do it as soon as we can. Um, between us, so is um, so the first the first group was on was on social development. Is this is the appointed spokesperson for spo social development? Hi. Here, who is that? Well, someone who was um, Kieran who was facilitating our discussion had to leave, so I'll just report back. Okay, thank you, yeah. Sonia. Okay. Um, okay, so I think we came we ended up coming up with a lot more questions through our discussions. Um, one of the things we spoke about was looking at hierarchies of power. So first of all, we started off, we didn't really get into social development as much. Um, we ended up speaking about women as perpetrators um, of caste-based violence um, and why that occurs. So I think one of the points we thought of why it occurs is because of the hierarchies of power, people don't want to let go of their power and privilege. It's quite a difficult thing to do. Um, so end up becoming perpetrators of violence. Um, and also women who have limited power um, and spoke about agency of women there. Um, we also spoke about um, prejudice and prejudice being universal. So one of the strands off of that is what can we do here in the UK to look at caste-based violence? Um, when it comes to, for example, intercaste marriages. And also, there seems to be a fine line between discussing um, caste-based violence as, and issues of inequality in India, but rarely reflecting where it happens in Europe, for example. So it seems to be a fine line between when it becomes actually just racist, just discussing it in one, with one lens and on like saying that happens just in India and just developing countries. Um, and what else do we speak about? Um, there's a need for civil society institutions to self-reflect. Um, and do the relationships that NGOs form with the higher castes operate as a form of censorship. Um, the difficulties, we also discuss a difficult, sorry, am I, is there too many points? No, it's fine. No, okay. Um, the difficulties that NGOs can have bringing up caste um, in policy, because, for example, I suppose in the UK context, for example, because um, there will, there's this, I suppose the UK government wants to be sensitive to um, BME, well, Indian Hindu groups here, um, who are also in positions of power in the UK and media and so forth. Um, and then I think the last thing we spoke about was, we asked the question, are international NGOs reflecting on white privilege and white power when it comes to pro uh, programs that they implement. Um, and we often see the white savior complex. So are international NGOs reflecting on this and looking at the impacts this has on programs on the ground? Thank you very much. Any other member of the group like to amplify or chip in on any of those points or? Shall we move on to group two? Okay, well we have four to cover. So, um, so group two was on economic development. Do we have a spokesperson from that group? Yeah. 
Thank you. Hello. Okay. Um, we, we had quite a wide-ranging discussion, but we've sort of tried to boil it down to four main points, which I will attempt to summarize coherently. Um, the, first, the first big discussion was about the concept of um, growth, which um, came up a lot this morning. Um, and we basically tried to, in a, in a very vague sense, I guess, um, focus in on the idea that growth needs to be specifically pro-poor, um, the, main, the main kind of definition of that is that um, we've talked thus far about how liberalization has um, lifted people out of poverty, but that has happened much slower for scheduled caste and scheduled tribe communities. So a pro-poor growth program would do um, a focused growth policy looking specifically at making sure scheduled caste and scheduled tribe communities um, have their incomes um, raised faster than any other specific group. Um, and also uh, look at job creation for those two communities. Um, then we looked at, you know, uh, specifically, sorry, at agriculture, which is the second point. Um, there was a discussion on the role of mechanization in Indian agriculture in different states and in Bangladesh, um, looking at how mechanization um, can end up either displacing labor or um, enabling agricultural productivity and growth, but also providing opportunities to absorb labor. So we talked about um, the importance of ensuring that uh, state-based policies to introduce mechanization um, ensure that labor remains a key part of the rural economy. Um, the, third, the third major point uh, was about the impacts of liberalization, which came up a fair amount. Um, we didn't talk a lot about this, but um, the basic idea is that liberalization has, um, as we said this morning, created um, new pockets of wealth in new castes, new communities, new jadis across the country. And this, has, um, this means that necessarily new areas or new locations of power have been created. So you have uh, new communities who are perhaps um, more self-interested now in stopping rural social mobility for people below them. Um, across rural and urban areas linked to urbanization and how can policy deal with the fact that whilst people are gaining in wealth that may mean that it slows down for SC and ST communities um, social mobility because these new locuses of, of wealth and power do not want that social mobility to happen. Um, and then the fourth point was uh, again quite a broad one looking at the role of the state more broadly in India. Um, we talked about you know, private sector versus public sector and affirmative action and so on. But the, the point that kept getting raised was that um, India's informally, uh, economy is largely informal. Um, and so when we talk about policies and have policy-based discussions, we need to interrogate whether that is necessarily where change is going to happen, given that I think it's 90 plus percent of uh, jobs in India are unregistered and informal. Um, and so is it really useful to talk purely about policy when talking about um, economic development and SC and ST communities. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, again, any, would anybody else like to ch chip in on, on that, please? I think there was a major point left out in that presentation, and that is the research has established that whilst there's a general decline in poverty in the country as a whole, it has not benefited Dalit people in general and women in the same, to the same extent, which means therefore the gulf, the inequality has widened. So this has two implications for policy. One, that there's need for upgrading the skills and educational and knowledge levels of Dalits, that means you need a major investment program, and secondly, to extend affirmative action to the corporate sector so that discrimination is tackled energetically. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, okay, let's move on. Uh, group three, gender, who's, who's our spokesperson okay. for group three? being a group of people sitting in London saying this is what Dalit women should be asking for or should be saying. And so we were keen to hear from um, the Dalit women present in the room what they really wanted rather than us 
trying to dictate the, the discourse. So from that, the first point was that um, the international community needs to work with women's movements in India and internationally to raise awareness of the issue, to break down the silos between caste and gender. So to see it as a, it's not just about caste, it's not just about gender, it's about both, and that this issue needs to be targeted particularly. Uh, it can't just be treated, the two issues, in isolation. Um, and then we talked about how we can consciously create spaces for women's voices to emerge, especially in India, but also internationally, and how we can maximize these spaces. We didn't come up with an answer, but it's a question for everyone here. And also how we can maximize the audiences um, in our different roles. So in the room we had um, Dalit activists, we had INGO workers, we had academics, um, independent consultants and lots of other people. So how we can use these spaces to talk to different people, different audiences to um, get the message out there about caste and gender being um, intersected. Um, there was also the point that INGOs in India, as they're um, writing their country strategy papers, that there's a role for the international community to <clears throat> advocate for, for Dalit women's rights to be included in these. That's a great way for this issue to get on the agenda of, of groups that are doing work on the ground in India. We then talked about social media, uh, how it's obviously a very powerful tool internationally and nationally to help uh, Dalit women to have a voice for themselves. The point was raised that uh, so much in this discourse is researchers doing research on Dalit people uh, in every facet of their lives rather than allowing Dalit women or Dalit people in general to speak for themselves. Um, and also that social media is a good way to interact with upper caste Indians, that there's a, a need to um, get them on board in this uh, from a mindset perspective. Um, there was also an extra point added at the end about um, manual scavenging. So one member of the team felt that this should be promoted widely on YouTube, the video that we saw, um, and that the term manual scavenging isn't heart-hitting enough that it should be called something like forced excrement collection to because manual scavenging doesn't actually um, resonate that much with people that don't know what it is in advance so they to get the message out there you might consider using another term or a tagline um, the final point was that there were there's so many stories out there about victimhood of Dalit women but there are also so many positive stories that, that that people have seen and experienced themselves. Stories of survival and triumph over discrimination, starting from childhood. And that it's really important to get these messages out there in social media, but also it could be something that INGOs could think about in their own um, campaigning and awareness raising. Um, partly because it's important to show the potential for um, positive change, but also because there's so much negative discourse around the lack of potential of Dalit people in India. Uh, you know, just ideas that um, Dalits will never succeed or will never um, uh, amount to much. And it's obviously not true. And positive messages about Dalit people could go some way to challenging that. And actually, the final point is that filmmakers going to India um, should try to represent Dalit women more and in more positive terms. So there was a point made that we have films, every, documentaries every night on different Indian cities, but rarely do Dalit women feature in these. And this would be another way for, 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 to get the message out there about the situation they find themselves in, but also the positive um, stories that, that they have as well. Thank you for a third very excellent summary. Um, additional points, please. Thank you. Okay, may I move on to group four on human rights? Thank you. Thank you very much. We also had a very lively discussion. And uh, it's worth pointing out that ours was not the only group talking about human rights since all other three groups were talking about human rights issues as well. 
Um, our first point was we wanted to encourage international actors and stakeholders such as development NGOs and academic institutions to adopt human rights-based approaches in their own organizational structures, to focus, for example, on key issues of non-discrimination internally with their, within their organizations, how they facilitate the right to participation, and how they are accountable, how they fulfill the right to accountability. And we pointed, for example, to Bond, uh, which could build on its recent motion on caste-based discrimination to reflect further on how its own members can better operationalize these human rights commitments. The second point was the need to globalize the issue. It's important that we widen the scope beyond India and beyond Hinduism. First, to help dilute Indian opposition. And second, uh, particularly on the international level, uh, and second, to reflect the reality of today that caste-based discrimination is a global issue and a multi-religious issue. Third, we focused on the increasing importance of the role of the international corporate sector, encouraging them to recognize and address caste-based discrimination in their supply chains in caste-affected countries, and the need to raise more awareness of this type of discrimination in order to address their labor rights uh, obligations and issues. And to do this with regard to the UN's um, uh, business and human rights guidelines. And working with those companies who have offices in caste affected countries uh, to encourage affirmative action policies in regard to recruitment and promotion. And then our fourth point was that greater attention should be paid in both development programs and in the research that is done to the issue of accountability as one means of empowering human rights defenders in this, on this issue. And we were very uh, impressed with the example from Ashif's campaign of how research on gaps in accountability to existing legislation was extremely important in, in empowering uh, women in the case, in the example that he gave and it's showing uh, concretely the failures of the government. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any additional points that may have slipped through? No, I think that's it. So, so thank you all four of you very much for excellent um, summaries of those discussions. As I said before, they, will be, they have been recorded in their own rights and they'll be written up in more detail so you'll be able to access more than just the key points um, in, in due course. Um, the manual scavenging term is also, I, I'm just picking up on that, it's just, it always struck me as a, as a strange euphemism that has to be explained um, and, and, you know, it might be something that um, the movement could pick up on on the clarification. I mean, it used to be night soil carrying, which is equally kind of quaint or rather quaint. Um, also, the existence of Dalit autobiographies in, in quite large numbers. Um, again, in, in the literary study, which we haven't dealt with here, um, I mean, um, we, we teach a course here on the politics of culture in contemporary South Asia at master's level, and we, we always have a session on, on Dalit, uh, Dalit narratives, Dalit artifacts. David has, has taken that in the past, if I remember correctly. Um, a very, very powerful body of literature, which is, perhaps should be brought to the attention of, of the wider world um, in, in, this, in this cause as well. Sorry, those are my own personal reflections. Um, we've got some time left, so we've got uh, the final item in the, in the agenda is a uh, is a panel discussion. So I think the idea is, David, if I'm right, to, to ask the presenters from the day to, uh, if they wouldn't mind, uh, resuming the stage. Um, and this will be an opportunity really to, uh, you know, a kind of a free-for-all, of, of, you know, fire, fire the questions you've been, you've been sitting on all day um, and haven't had a chance to, to ask, all the comments and, and the suggestions um, that you may have uh, for discussion by a particular member of the panel um, that you haven't had a chance to ask a question of, or, or more generally. But David, you're going to chair this, this bit. Yeah.
This chair, this chair, this chair. just said the this is the final session we'll continue until half past and then we have a, um, a drinks reception and I hope everybody will um, stay around for that um, as Mike said it's a, it's an opportunity for people to put further questions um, I think the, the the two questions that uh, perhaps we would um, could organize our, our thinking and questions around is uh, first of all what do we need to know I think there are uh, uh, questions that came up about things that we, um, areas of research that have yet to, to be um, undertaken, um, some of the mapping that uh, um, Barbara uh, showed us in the morning suggested questions that we, um, that we might want to ask. There are lots of questions that we don't have answers to um, about the nature of the differences, the different experiences of Dalits, of, of Adivasis in different parts. Of, of, the, of the region and also in different sectors of the, of the economy. I think a second perhaps question is not just what do we need to know but how should we come to know it? Um, what sort of research should be done? With whom? How should the research be led? What's the role for um, action research as opposed to research done by academics? And I'd certainly be interested to have some um, uh, comments from, from panel members on, on that question of how we, we, we should know who should uh, do it. And the second uh, question is what is to be done and likewise who is to do it. Uh, we have questions of what are, is the role of international organisations but we also have um, the question of what processes of self-organisation and action um, that uh, have emerged from, um, from, from the grassroots. And uh, this is a, a, a good point for me to introduce Dr. Sundra Babu uh, who was a, um, a resource person in the social development group, um, who has really been central to um, uh, recent processes of self-organized um, uh, interventions in areas of Dalit rights, but in particular land and resources development um, in various parts of, uh, of Tamil Nadu, but also much more broadly creating the possibility of links and alliances between different um, subordinated, oppressed, disadvantaged groups, uh, whether Adivasi, um, whether um, uh, Dalit, uh, whether fisher folk, and other, and other groups. So I hope that uh, uh, Sundar Babu will, will, will bring us, uh, haul us down to the ground realities of grassroots work to show th the moments at which um, organizing thinking around ideas of caste actually become. Um, uh, useful, but when they're not useful, and how the, some of the practical strategies that uh, that emerge from uh, from field from from working at, um, from field work that, that you've been involved with. So, with that sort of set of, of questions, um, I first of all ask the panel if anybody would, in the panel would like to kick off with, with with further comments on any of those on any of those points, and then people from the audience, if you'd like to sort of put your put your points, and then we'll see how it goes. <laughs> what do we need to know? Well, I, I will take the last issue uh, that you mentioned, the role of international organization, particularly funding, and its linkages with the self-organization that you mentioned. 
I think there are uh, certainly effort on the part of the Dalit to organize. But uh, the organizing poor is always a difficult proposition. So there are, uh, there are organizations, but weak and scattered. And the, the support from international funding agencies <coughs> during the last 40, 30, 50 years has helped uh, to organize the Dalit, uh, particularly in NGOs and civil society organizations. Uh, all funding agencies in India, uh, particularly, and outside, Dalit has been issue on their agenda. Dalit women came later. So whatever little funding that uh, was given to the Dalits, NGO and activists, it has helped to develop a, uh, the collective action through NGOs and other groups, and also development of Dalit leadership uh, at local level. It has helped quite a lot. But during the last 15, 10 years or so, uh, because of the withdrawal of the funding agency from India, because of the government policy perhaps, all funding agencies that, that have origin in Europe have gone back. Uh, there is none now left. Only four of them were allowed to stay. One is Defeat, a German uh, Canadian Development Agency, and four foundation. Now their status has also been reduced to a minimum now. I think one of the bad consequences of this withdrawal of the funding was on the Dalit particularly, because Dalit had began to mobilize and develop into a self-organization, and this withdrawal of funding, little as it is, uh, has hampered them. I think, therefore, uh, there, is a, there was an appeal from others that the, the funding organization here in UK and different countries should retain the priorities uh, to help them. Anybody else want to pick up on, on that point, or, or should we, or, or if I could just put this out? Um, yes. Thank you. I'm uh, Ricky Nolan from the International Dalit Solidarity Network. Uh, I, would, I would just like to share with you, and in particularly the research community, that you may find uh, some of the resources available within IDEAS, and particularly on our website, uh, helpful, at least to some extent. We try to capture as much as we can on international developments and on uh, the issues that have been discussed today, uh, which is brought from the members of uh, the communities in the affected countries. And uh, we issue a monthly uh, newsletter, uh, email, and there's free subscription. And we try to capture, again, developments in the UN uh, on the particular issue of caste discrimination. We would also like to extend um, uh, an invitation for a closer association with, with researchers as research associates to IDSN. And, uh, and uh, this is a possibility that's opening up now. Uh, and it is mainly with a view to enable a further flow of information and underlying also the underlining the importance of the research that's actually taking place. So if this within the research community, so if, if information on the topics, the studies, the research could be shared in some common platform uh, within the IDSN or related to the IDSN, we are happy to, to see how this could uh, be facilitated. Thank you. And by the way, congratulations to SOAS and the, the organizations behind this conference. It has been an amazingly rich experience. Thank you. Thank you. In the morning, Barbara White showed some maps which indicated, roughly speaking, that some areas of the country the discrimination pattern was far greater against Dalits than in others in a variety of areas. So the one issue is, what are the criteria for success in tackling discrimination and effectiveness of policies of affirmative action? Uh, and why is it in others it fails? So maybe research could focus on uh, that issue, uh, providing guidelines where it can be more effective and where 
you know, in what ways. And secondly, the funding agencies could help equip the Dalit organizations in particular to conduct a social audit of those policies with a view to make those authorities accountable to what they are expected to achieve. Thank you. You are talking about uh, <coughs> the aid agencies. Um, see, the government of India making their policy is their concern. The UK-based uh, INGOs are supported by taxpayers' money and the generosity of the people. And they have to spend their money wisely. Now, if you take the number of uh, the global poor, one-third of the global poor are coming from uh, a community affected by caste discrimination. One-third means, I categorically say, 400 million people of ACST, Dalit Christians, Dalit Muslims, Dalit Sikhs, Dalit Buddhists, and a certain amount of uh, backward communities. So from an international perspective, a global perspective, from the poverty reduction perspective, uh, NGOs, INGOs have to thematize this particular area, caste discrimination, Dalits and caste discrimination, they have to thematize. So far, never thematic, uh, uh, you know, subject uh, area in any of the aid agencies. Secondly, as they thematize, they have to allocate appropriate funds for this particular subject. And uh, it can be uh, uh, given to NGOs working in India. I mean, NGOs, again, quotation, what kind of NGOs and how are they are constituted? Are they capable of absorbing the target population in its uh, uh, decision-making powers? And, uh, the assets created are in their name and the decision making is with them. Now, there are uh, uh, NGOs working here also, UK based NGOs. Uh, we need to raise the consciousness of UK public on the causes of poverty. That has been there since uh, Prayer Short has been the uh, 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 development secretary. That, uh, uh, NGOs have undertaken the responsibility to educate the UK masses on the uh, uh, cause of poverty, the root cause of poverty of global poor and, their in, uh, and its impact on the lives of uh, British citizens here, which they have not done. And so far, uh, they have been evading this subject and there is a network called the British Overseas NGOs in Development. They have the advisory capacity as well as, uh, you know, even now they are funding also to a certain extent to defeat, advisory capacity to defeat. Now this network is composed of more than 450 organizations, <coughs> including all the major uh, aid agencies of uh, Disaster Emergency Committee and all that. And in two of their uh, general body meeting, we tried to bring in a special... Try, try to be brief, Eugene, yeah. because the, I know it's an important point, but if you try to be brief, because there's quite a lot of... Uh, <coughs> Have a do you want me to say this point? Or? Yes, just to okay. concisely. If I, the, two, of, two of the meetings we tried to bring in a motion, a special motion. Last uh, AGM, we have succeeded with the support of Christian Aid, and we are very thankful to Christian Aid for that. The motion is this This House recognizes that caste and discrimination based on work and descent actively contribute to the structural causes of poverty and inequality among Dalits and other excluded communities. It calls for bond members to express solidarity and work towards addressing this problem as appropriate. Once they have, they have adopted it, they are obliged to form support groups. And the one uh, meeting was convened on the 15th of May. There is more uh, meetings to come. But if more members of the NGO community show interest in this, definitely this can be taken to Concord, that's European uh, network, from their the UNDP, from the United Nations point of view. So this is a, a entry we got in a 
structure that can be taken forward. And I request that all the NGOs who are members of the British Overseas NGO to uh, support this motion again. And also to take uh, this conference to take this as an agenda to take it forward. Thank you very much. It's a very good and uh, practical suggestion as to how to uh, consolidate uh, a commitment to address the question of the past. So, yes, some responses from the people in the panel to those points. Um, I don't know. <clears throat> I don't know if it's a response, but just my comments. Um, I think we, we uh, really need to face the reality that situation back home is very complex and um, the struggles of uh, our community has also been very real. And um, whether we all uh, in this room are there or not, that struggle for justice and dignity has been there for a long time. It will continue in its own way. Uh, that is the, 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 the spirit of resilience of, of our community. But I think uh, um, in this whole complex uh, reality today, we need to find ways together uh, how we could accelerate or escalate that uh, struggle uh, and those demands uh, uh, for justice. Uh, in that whole arena, I just want to say two points. Is one is that um, as uh, activists and especially as uh, Dalit women uh, activists, in this whole complex uh, scenario, we've really stuck our neck, uh, necks out, uh, challenging um, uh, the state and also challenging perpetrators and uh, actually tackling uh, state impunity. Do, because of that, now the also issues of us, um, Dalit uh, women, human rights defenders itself is, is an issue, whether it's in the digital spheres or whether it is in the, you know, in the physical sphere. So, what can we as the international community uh, look to actually um, uh, uh, contribute uh, in, in that area is, is, my, uh, is my ask. Uh, second is that um, uh, Dalit women are organizing, they are, you know, uh, having their own narratives and their uh, articulations. It's a slow process, but it's very much uh, happening. And I think the point was made earlier about agency of, uh, uh, you know, really Dalit women uh, leaders on the ground. And I think this group can really um, offer us, uh, in, our, in our organizing, uh, links with other uh, women of, radical women of color uh, organizing that is happening across the globe. Also trans people's organizing and how those challenges are being faced. So there's so much for us to uh, learn from those uh, uh, those streams of uh, organizing, and I think um, that is another uh, ask that uh, I, I want to uh, place to this group. Uh, the, the issue of uh, addressing the, the where the international development is, uh, uh, the, especially the funding to those issues, are declining quite rapidly. That's a reality. Uh, but on the other hand, the influence of the, the business uh, sector is quite rapidly increasing in India and South Asia region. So I certainly see there is a need for uh, bringing a little more uh, focused uh, uh, on these issues, results with the business community, using appropriate mechanism, whether it would be UN business and human rights framework or the whole issue of uh, equality, diversity, whatever the mechanisms in which they feel. I think that's an area where we need to look at it but the, the challenge part is also the whole issue of what uh, Ashwini and others also shared. In fact, a couple of us, we sit in the Affirmative Action Council of uh, CII. Uh, it's not such as uh, signing a signatory to an Affirmative Action Policy. I think the whole challenge is how you convert that policy into action. There you see the major challenge. And there are 13 points in the Affirmative Action Policy. There is a Code of Conduct, which is a very, very self-explanatory which puts the responsibility at the CEO level, at the board level to deliver. But you sign and you don't produce the report. This is exactly the, the culture of where you enact and you showcase and you neglect or you forget. So this is an area where I think we need to reimpose. So I certainly feel one is a fear of penalty through law, which you do. But if it comes voluntarily and which you believe that it is in your business case you need to promote equality and diversity, that's a much stronger statement. But we need a stronger debate and discourse on this issue. It cannot be left to the few Dalit groups or the Dalit human rights movements alone to do that. So that's where I certainly see a greater role for people 
professionals working in the media and the private sector, the business sector to articulate these issues much more strongly. That is where I think we can create a momentum. And if the business community can take it, where the 90% of the jobs, either in the informal or other sector that are available, certainly I think some of the economic challenges or a lack of opportunities could be certainly addressed. The second point I want to make, uh, David, so one is most of these issues we are looking from a uh, punitive point of view. So you have committed atrocities, there is an issue of where this is the punishment. So even the law we have is the Scheduled Cast Scheduled Tribe Prevention of Atrocities Act. There is no, even though the, the name is a prevention act, I have yet to come across where it has actually prevented an atrocity. So therefore, how do you make this loss much more preventive? So therefore, it is the cost, is the state of mind. How do we change the mind? So I'm yet to come across a proper thilo, a framework, a training framework. We have a frame, good, excellent frameworks on gender training on areas other issues. I'm yet to come across how do you look this address this in a, a framework which can take the individuals and the groups through a process of exploration of what this identity means. So somewhere I think uh, there is a role where we need to look at how do we create the knowledge and as well as the mechanisms you create that kind of a discourse can take. Otherwise, it's a, it's, it cannot be the struggle of 20% against the rest of 80%. But if we can change the minds of 80%, I think the 20% can invest their product to time in much more other areas, which I think it will, it will help the, uh, not only the Dalits, but also the entire economy. So in that sense, I see there is a, an investment we need to look into that. Thank you. I just want to add, just on the, just adding to the excellent points that you raised, you know, on this uh, uh, voluntary affirmative action, <coughs> it's, it's worse than that. So one is you sign and you don't do anything. That, of course, is happening. The other is they uh, are passing it off in this corporate social responsibility. So they'll open some so stitching center for poor women or something like that. The, whereas the charter in the affirmative action, the voluntary charter is very explicit about what that measure is supposed to be. But the kinds of measures that companies are passing off as affirmative action, it has nothing to do with those 13 points. So it doesn't address caste-based discrimination. It doesn't talk about inclusion. It is some, you know, stitching center, some literacy school, something or the other. And it has no understanding of caste at all. But if you read the annual reports, they will pass it off as their commitment to the affirmative action program. So it's subversion at a much bigger scale. And that is the danger with this voluntary thing, which is that, you know, how do you hold companies accountable? And so uh, that was one of the issues that we were discussing with the IDSN and, you know, trying to say that if you make it as a good business case, then maybe there's some chance that companies will adopt it. You know, so that's uh, something that we need to do. I wonder if I could bring uh, Sundar Babu in here in terms of local accountability and some of the way in which work at the grassroots can also generate uh, accountability of a more direct kind. Uh, yeah, good evening. Uh, uh, I mean, I, I, I would like to start with uh, what Anand was referring as knowledge and discourse uh, in the context of Dalits. Uh, so like since morning we have been uh, talking a lot of uh, sad stories and, and the mess that is uh, around us. But we also have uh, you know, other history, you know, it's, it's not that bad also. But, uh, I think many of you have noticed, I mean, I, I just noticed at the entrance, uh, Thiruvallur statue. Um, Thiruvallur himself is a, is a, is a Dalit, uh, he's, a, he's a caste, uh, his caste is Valluvar, and they, so his name comes as Thiruvallur. Uh, and um, uh, Thiruvallur was supposed to be uh, 2,200 years old now. So it's 200 years before Christ. So there are enough um, uh, traces and uh, enough sources in history and literature uh, about Dalit scholarship uh, that existed. So one side we have this uh, version that the Manusmriti doesn't uh, give access to knowledge for the Dalit communities. But on the other side, we have certain communities which are now coming under the scheduled caste, but having a lot of uh, uh, history and, uh, and background on uh, literature. Uh, second uh, um, aspect which I wanted to draw attention was, uh, uh, see, one of the uh, issues which uh, I personally think we face at the ground level uh, is this uh, term Dalit Christians. Uh, had it been 
probably if it was Christian Dalits, if, uh, as people used to call before, uh, things would have gone ahead. Uh, I feel that we, we went into a status quo mode when we re rephrased it as Dalit Christians. Uh, because um, there, uh, I, I find, I feel that, uh, like when we talk about the ground, uh, many, many of these people actually want to talk about the caste question, uh, but then they are uh, they're, you know, separate in religion. But when you bring this Dalit Christian as a category, and then the way uh, the donor agencies have approached the whole thing, uh, the whole energy was directed against the state or the government. So what happens to the Dalit Christians? Because the Dalit Christians have to ask for the rights, uh, ask for their protection, but who do they ask uh, their protection from? From the state. So somewhere uh, we were lost, I think, uh, in, in, that, in that kind of a coinage. Had, uh, had we stuck to the Christian Dalit, uh, category probably many other uh, discussions would have um, gone ahead. I mean, this is something which we we are discussing at the ground level. We are trying to explore what went wrong and how we, how things have been articulated, and also uh, we are trying to uh, like I am part of uh, the federation which are working on land rights in South India. Uh, we are trying to understand caste uh, from the perspective of ecosystems. So the different ecosystems uh, seem to be having. Uh, different understanding on these uh, caste hierarchies. So the, the, the five ecosystems like um, the hill and uh, people around uh, the hill, uh, people on the coast, uh, people around the uh, desertified areas, uh, people living near uh, forests, and uh, people living in the <coughs> plains closer to the river. So the caste uh, uh, hierarchies and untouchabilities seem to be very strong with communities and uh, societies around rivers, which had uh, more access to the fresh water and which got uh, involved in agriculture in a big way. Uh, the caste seemed to be weaker with the people who were associated with the hills or the coast or uh, uh, the desert. Uh, so the, the untouchability factors were very, very strong. That's what we were witnessing. Uh, in our field uh, visits. We are trying to explore, I mean, we are trying to do further studies on these issues uh, about how um, gender and um, uh, caste is being understood in different ecosystems uh, and uh, trying to understand also religion from that perspective. So these are some, some of these initiatives which are going on and we are, we are involved with some grassroots research on, on these subjects. Well, not so much a question, just a short comment. I noticed that uh, we're talking about multinational corporations and other non-Indian states all the time as some kind of neutral players who need to be sensitized to caste discrimination and to caste atrocities. But I think what also needs to be done is to reveal um, the active uh, participation and promotion of some of these corporations and states in um, encouraging a very politically contested capitalist um, the process of economic development in India that is deepening caste inequalities and that is creating a lot of the caste tensions that um, are behind some of these atrocities. So that's my point. Uh, yes, uh, Andrew, and then, uh, uh, yeah, we'll just take two or three uh, points. They didn't have to be questions, just whatever you want. Uh, this isn't a question, it's a comment, just it's. Um, a lot of things today, there was a lot of things we learned today, um, one of which was the complexity of the issues. Um, I think that what we need to look at is not so much a solution to the problem as a process which will get us towards some situation of justice. Um, I think a starting point for that is if we go back to one of the original ideas of this conference was to challenge development actors about how they're going to properly engage with the issue of caste in a way that they haven't been hitherto. One of the things that everybody in this room could do and should do, I think, within the next couple of days is to go to the NGOs that they work for, go to the NGO support, go to the NGOs they volunteer and ask them, what are you doing to end the system of caste-based apartheid in South Asia? and keep pestering them until they come up with decent answers. Eugene points out the imperative of the bond uh, resolution in the UK this year. 
There also is, it's not explicit in the Sustainable Development Goals, but there is a recognition of a need for inclusivity within the Sustainable Development Goals. NGOs, development community are going to have to respond to that also. I think as they start to grapple with that, we need to be pushing at them consistently in terms of saying this is an issue which you have to address and not tolerating whenever they come up with inadequate answers to it. Would it be possible to have a Dalit respecting score for South Asian organisations for UK investors and traders? Would it be possible to construct a Dalit respecting score or measure for South Asian organisations so that UK investors and traders are aware of it? Respecting scores? Scores. Oh, score. Oh, score. index kind of. Oh, like an index. Like an index so that the investors can. But they have the ideas on it. In addition to his point, is it, I mean, when it comes to child labor eradication, there are uh, uh, relatively successful stories. We have had trade movement. Why don't we pick up some of the models and include, include the caste agenda in, based on those models? Because you can, uh, I mean, recently there were Bangladesh fire in a uh, textile, uh, sorry, um, garment industry. So is it possible to copy and incorporate such ideas in it, when it comes to caste discrimination as well, where you will act as a pressure group or a method to put pressure on the business houses? And it's going to be a very challenging one because the Indian government and Indian public in general seems to be on a very self-assertive, or we are on the uh, develop the nation kind of uh, me mentality. But it, there should be a way and method where you can put child labor issue kind of uh, propaganda. I want to uh, make only one point about the civil society space in India. So like uh, everybody knows, uh, civil society space in India is shrinking. And actually, civil society now facing uh, two problems. One is a funding-related problem, because they are not getting uh, funding as previously. They uh, uh, like receive, and uh, Thorats have already raised this issue. And another uh, various kind of foundation, or like the legal uh, uh, provisions, where civil society are not able to raise their issue. Uh, uh, very openly or like the, they are not able to organize any protest or anything but due to some uh, legislation like FCRA uh, regulation. At a some level, Government of India passed some rules like uh, CSR, they make a provision in the Companies Act and now every, uh, like the company need to uh, put 2% their income into the CSR. But at the same time, this money they invest for uh, their business also. Like they use their money for the more development of their business and sometimes some companies invest this money and, uh, uh, to the government projects and they give to the government. For example, uh, uh, like uh, uh, national uh, uh, sanitation campaign, so many companies invest this money to the uh, government project. So these kind of things are there and that's why like the international uh, like organization and outsiders believe that uh, India government now more pro-civil society and they are promoting to the uh, like industry to invest in the civil society. Uh, so these kind of things are there. So my uh, like request is keep uh, the international uh, researchers and the organization now need to work on this issue and highlight these kind of problems. And uh, the second thing, uh, our Prime Minister will come uh, to U uh, UK. So I think if uh, civil society here, like the civil society organization and the researchers, during uh, the visit, if highlighted these kind of issues, then uh, these issues get more attention. Thank you. Uh, just to... Can I... Yes, I think, I think we're, going to, we're going to draw to a, to a close now. So last comments from there. Uh, one more. Yeah, uh, uh, in response to the... Uh... Uh, the the index of dignity or social discrimination and is used uh, for
for the policy purposes uh, and uh, uh, some research agenda which David uh, has uh, raised in the beginning. I think uh, uh, looking at the research, uh, uh, it is possible to develop an uh, exclusion index on based on the some sort of a secondary data. Uh, I have tried and I think uh, Ashwini Deshpande has also tried in her book, uh, but uh, you cannot build up any relationship. For example, we have number of cases registered under the Untouchability Act, number of cases registered under the Atrocity Act, figure were given. So you can work out a ratio, number of cases per thousand of population for the states and see which states uh, incidence of discrimination is much higher than others and then see the relationship with incidence of poverty or human development index. But I don't think it is it really worked because state like Bihar where the atrocities are more, the case, number of cases registered is much lower because awareness is not there, institution do not help. But I mean, nevertheless, uh, one can make that uh, attempt. I will only make one point at the end is uh, about the private sector. See, why is it that the private sector in India, the philanthropical efforts are very less? Uh, the roots are to be found in the, to a greater extent in the religion. The, uh, the, the, it is not that there is no philanthropy in India, but the philanthropy is caste bound. You look at the banks, Saraswat Bank, that is the Brahmin Bank, Shudra Bank, that is the bank started by Shudra. I mean, banks are there by the caste names, and there there must be millions of or, uh, of social network around the caste. We do not know what what is lacking by the private sector and civil society is the is the social philanthropy for Dalit. And that because there is no passion, there is no morality in the Hindu philosophy whereby you can develop a sympathy for them. Religion tells them not to um, help them. And the, the, the Hindu civil society is victim of that ideology. And that is why there is a lack of uh, philanthropy towards the uh, uh, Dalit. So you do require law, you do require compulsion to, and the only thing that you can do, I'll make last point, David, I won't take much time, only point that you can do, because that is our experience that whatever affirmative action policy has been developed for private sector, it was uh, by proving to them that they practice discrimination in employment. We gave them evidence, uh, and it is only that which curts, curts the ice with the private sector, not the moral argument. Now, uh, therefore, in this context, I will make a suggestion that we require a research agenda on one point, namely what we know is that there is a discrimination. There is a sufficient evidence now to prove that there is discrimination in market, non-market, social sphere, and then there is a outcome variable. We know the level of poverty, malnutrition, education backwardness. What we do not know, and that is why policy is affected, what we do not know is how does social discrimination or economic discrimination through what channel is affect the Dalit access to resources. The channel we have not been yet able to identify. What we know is labor market discrimination and high unemployment among Dalit. But how does this discrimination affect, I mean employment, affect the unemployment and employment or education? There is a lot, large dropout among the scheduled caste. There is a discrimination in the classroom. How does the discrimination in the classroom discourage Dalit children and lead to dropout and disinterest? So that channel has to be captured through research. going to uh, end with any last points that uh, panel members would like to make, and then we'll continue informally uh, with our reception. Uh, um, <clears throat> just to add to some of our friends made intervention, uh, friends, uh, the last uh, 10 years are now by <coughs> the previous uh, Prime Minister or the present Prime Minister, you might be hearing very often that India is shining, India is developed. India has developed in the science and technology communications. And uh, uh, they said it, uh, India has uh, uh, attained uh, self sufficiency We don't want external cooperation. So by saying this, <coughs> uh, trying to 
uh, sweep away all the realities of the other part of the community which are suffering and India trying to get the uh, permanent membership in the Security Councils of UN. That is their main, main objectives. Uh, that is why today or the, even the previous government they extended millions of euros to European <coughs> Commission which the whole world has been shocked and the uh, Indian government is extending cooperation to many other countries. But the point is, the reality is that so many uh, millions of Dalits have been suffered in terms of poverty, health and many other uh, services, uh, entitlement, but it has been denied. My point is that even some of the INGs also take this index and trying to face out from the, this kind of interventions from the country by saying that India has developed. And there has been many research, academic research, action based research, which reveals which has not been properly uh, taken care. And, uh, and uh, even now, the government has asked some of the NGOs to, NGOs to close down their offices in, in, uh, in India. But, but it's mainly their focus is to show that India has been developed. But the reality, the other reality remains the same. So this need to be taken care and uh, what uh, Dr. Pragash Lewis said, the, the discrimination index need to be taken into account while we formulating the policies of the INGOs. And my own experience that the people who have been involved in the formulating policies also sometimes misguide. I know my, my experience, one of the UK-based organizations, they took a stand not to support any activists of their travel cars to going to Durban conference participating because it is going to be the against the state. So that is the kind of uh, uh, conclusion or arrived or recommendations are made by the, the consultant who are appointed by the INGOs. So that, that aspect needs to be really taken care of while formulating the policies. Finally, from morning I've been hearing the, the term very often lower caste and upper caste. I think somewhere we have to get away from that. There is no lower caste and higher caste is our, our mindset. So whenever you want to quote, please quote us uh, in quoted that it's upper caste, so-called upper caste and so-called lower caste. Or you use the dominant caste and if you want to refer the Dalits and as a Dalits. Otherwise, no perpetrators. Yes, perpetrators, upper, uh, dominant caste. Otherwise then uh, consciously or unconsciously, we are also imbibed in our mind the same caste values. Thank you very much. Did anybody else have a final point they want to make? Um, if not, then it just leaves uh, it just leaves it to me to um, to close the session um, formally, and then we'll we'll go upstairs for our um, drinks reception. Um, just I'd like to give a, a big thank you to all of our panel members and uh, Prakash who I think is hiding somewhere. Um, and we've been extremely fortunate to bring together such an extremely um, high profile, talented and eminent um, collection of individuals and uh, um, people have traveled a long way um, sometimes overcoming all sorts of uh, obstacles and acquiring um, their, their travel arrangements, visa arrangements and whatnot but I'm delighted that everybody actually uh, more or less everybody um, made it and thank you for such incredibly stimulating uh, thought-provoking <coughs> and important contributions we have a lot of food for thought and as Mike has said we will Consider this as a sort of base for pulling together ideas, making this uh, material, uh, the presentations and some of the discussion material available um, on the, on the web page. And we will be opening blogs for continuing discussion. And uh, there is an existing questionnaire, set of questions for people to post comments. So we would like to regard this as the beginning of a conversation and a debate on the relationship between caste, caste discrimination, inequality and development 
um, and gender as, a, as an essential part of understanding those forces of caste and caste discrimination. And to see this as something that, that will be just the, the, the start of something which will, will continue. And especially uh, the hope is that those people representing organizations uh, will take um, whatever has been gained and, and uh, from this, um, uh, these conversations back to organizations from which um, they have come and to pose those questions that, um, that, were, that, were, that were raised uh, a, a moment ago. Um, so thank you very much indeed and thank you also for those um, co-organizers um, of, this, of this event. Really this would not have been possible without um, the, 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 um, the lead taken by Karuna Trust, by Christian Aid, um, Anti-Slavery International, Village uh, Service Trust and the Dalit Solidarity Network UK. This has really been a collaborative effort. Uh, we've had many meetings over many months uh, thinking about how to organise this and bring it to you. And I'm extremely grateful from the point of view and speaking, as I may, if I may, for the <laughs> South Asia Institute of, of SARS and, and Mike, who's here. Thank you, Mike, um, for, the, um, for the hosting from, um, from the South Asia Institute. Thank you all. Now we go upstairs, back to the suite. Of course, yes. Just to thank Jane Savory of the Centres and Programmes Office, who gave up her, gave up her Saturday for us. Sangeeta, who must be very fit now from running around with a mic. And, and Helen the same, wherever she is, um, and everybody else who, who made it possible. So, the last scribes and volunteers. Everybody who, everybody, all the comment, everybody, everybody. So, let's let's all go and have a, a celebratory drink. Thank you. <laughs>